Squirrel Hill as a neighborhood was our first choice. It's a warm community. And it's a community where people feel safe. To have the access within a couple of blocks of coffee shops and a movie theater. Parks are marvelous, they're real jewels. The Good Eats down in the you know Forbes and Murray Avenue. We have really uh, well-educated, highly motivated people that are just so enthusiastic about supporting their community uh, and who show up. Uh, and don't just say, this is what you should do. Uh, they say, this is what we should do, and I'm going to help you do it. It's good for business when you're involved in the community, when people see that you're active and interested and engaged. And so it's been a pleasure, really, to be involved with the Urban Coalition. Beautification projects, uh, the entrance uh, coming off the parkway to Squirrel Hill. Commercial development and responding to it. Mini garden installations. We've just finished renovating the parklet next to the Squirrel Hill post office. The magazine is a real resource, uh, and lots of people want to write for that magazine. They're doing a very interesting analysis of stormwater runoff. We also are dealing with bike trails and bike connections and pedestrian safety. A major issue, of course, for many businesses, ours included, is parking. How can we plan for that? How can we, through zoning and community discussions and process, come up with a, a better master plan? And now one of the main focuses of the, of the coalition is going to be getting re-involved with public education and getting the community substantially involved with public education. We want to build strong, sustainable communities. But we do so with the voice of the community guiding us. One of the great things that the coalition does is to have these dinners and to make these awards because it shows you that there are outstanding people who either through their artistic achievement or their involvement in the community have become treasures. They really have become individuals that are worthy of recognition. Mike Chen started his um, beginnings here in Squirrel Hill about 30 years ago when on Murray Avenue he uh, started the first Chinese uh, grocery store. Um, if we look around today, you know, up and down Murray and Forbes, we have all sorts of um, delicious and scrumptious eateries um, representing the, you know, pan um, Asian um, Pacific um, region. I asked him 20 years ago if I could invest in one of his restaurants and he always seemed to put me off. And uh, when it was time for this most recent venture, he asked me and I said, yeah, I'd love to. And the rest is history. His ideas are what end up on the menu. And he has specific requirements of what things should look like, what they should taste like, and how they should be prepared. Mike is very passionate of what he do. And he want to make sure, you know, everything that he brings together will work well with the community and the people. So he is a people person. Anything to help the, the community, especially School Hill. I think he'd been in School Hill a long time and then moved to Shadyside. And then I'll come back to School Hill, of course. I think that's his favorite. He can be an ambassador. He wanted, he said to me, to showcase what is great about Taiwan. So he brings over the, um, every six months um, these um, master chefs from Taiwan. He's also a man with a big, big heart. Whatever you need, you can call him or talk to him. He'll get it done or embrace you. Instead of um, relishing in all of his prosperity by himself, he decided that it was going to be more important to have an LLC and let all of his employees partake in all of this new success. And so um, since he's been here in the 30 years, I believe he's had about 13 restaurants and they all co-own this um, particular endeavor. He's quite a guy. David Stock, born in Squirrel Hill, takes Pittsburgh and Squirrel Hill to the world. He's conducted everywhere. His music has been performed in Australia, in Korea, in Uzbekistan. David's always challenged me to 
play music by living composers. And I think it's a wonderful thing to have living composers on the air at, at, at QED. And David's always been part of the mix since the very beginning of WQED-FM. He's been a real important part of it from day one. But he says, you play mostly music by dead European composers. Let's have some living American composers. And I think he's right. It's great that he challenges us that we don't play enough 20th century music. We can always play more, and David's music is at the top of our, our list for living American composers. David started Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble. There was virtually no contemporary music in Pittsburgh. It was very few. And he single-handedly brought um, contemporary music to Pittsburgh. And I think the impact that David had on the the music of Pittsburgh is tremendous. Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble is without a doubt the center of our new music life here in Pittsburgh and has been for the better part of 40 years. QED is really lucky because he started the group with WQED FM, but those new music programs have been heard uh, from our archive over the years, over the 41 years of the radio station has been on the air around the globe through the internet and locally. In Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble concert, I got to know most of the composers of the United States. I mean, I got to know John Cage, I got to know Milton Babbitt, I got to know uh, Steve Reich, uh, any composers uh, that Philip Glass, all of the composers who are right now uh, in, in, the, in the national level of uh, United States music, they came to Pittsburgh. And they had their music performed by David Stock, he conducted it, he commissioned many of them. David has helped composers, many, many composers, young composers, and he has generously given. Because you see, the resources are very, uh, very limited in arts in general, especially in music. David's family is extremely important to him, and of course he has deep roots in spirituality through his Jewish faith. It influences many of his pieces, and uh, it has broadened, I think, Jewish folk music, the klezmer music, which he's woven into a number of his compositions, broadened the audience for that kind of music. People have found it because of David, so his spiritual life is very important to him, and his Jewish faith, which comes from his family. Uh, so many members of his family live in Squirrel Hill, still do to this day, or were brought up there. Uh, his decades living in Squirrel Hill couldn't help but have been influenced by the Jewish community in Pittsburgh. He's a fantastic writer and very fast writer. I often uh, joke with him that when I write, you know, one measure, he already finished one movement. So, you know, I say, you know, if when I finish in a, a movement in a, in a week, you have already finished the symphony. So he's, he's a very fast writer and he's a very, uh, you know, and he can write any type of music. And, uh, you know, no matter what kind of music, uh, but, but he has a love, and I think his love is for neoclassicism, and you can very distinctly see that um, in his music. And I think he's a continuation of the great school of neoclassicism in the United States. When people are looking back at the cultural life in Pittsburgh during these years, he's one of the figures, certainly a major figure, that people will look at. The one thing everybody knows about Bill, just a great human being. There's nobody more loyal, there's nobody more kind, and he's always there. He loves the city, that's clear. I think every superintendent would say Bill was probably their most effective board member. He's like the ultimate uh, civic engagement person uh, in Pittsburgh because he's working so hard in so many areas. Workforce development on child education, and the list is endless. It goes on and on and on unsung hero. He'd say, oh, I want you to meet this person, and that person ultimately would end up doing something really special for kids in the school district. When you talk about Fred Rogers, certainly one of the greatest men of all time, genius. But that genius needed somebody who was like Bill, street savvy, smart, always watching out for Fred. Bill didn't look at Fred as anything more than absolutely the person who could change things to make things better. Bill has always said, you can get a lot done if you don't care who gets credit for it. And I think he always does what's necessary to get the job done, regardless of whether he's given the credit or not. There are just so many incidents that you later learn from other people 
like they were in the hospital and he visited them there every day, or they were going through a tough time in their life and he called them every morning. One of the things I know for sure will be his legacy is this passion, interest, drive to expand early childhood education in Pittsburgh. Um, that's his baby, and um, he is uh, always um, pushing us to think about how can we better serve our youngest uh, Pittsburghers. Consequently, we have an early childhood uh, program in the district that is highly regarded. Uh, we wish we could uh, actually serve more children, um, but there'll always be um, a legacy from Bill about uh, the passion and commitment to early childhood. Arthur Griffin, who was on the school board in, in Charlotte Mecklenburg, always said to me, it's all about achievement, it's all about students. You have to focus on that. We have to get the best teachers to teach, we have to get the best administrators to administrate, and we have to get people involved. We have to get parents involved and, and the rest of the community. I really believe in the city, I believe in the community, and I believe in the people. One of the absolute greatest preparatory institutions in the United States. It really teaches you how to compete, how to study, how to think. Even when I went there in 1971, it was the, uh, the premier school in the school system. I was the uh, second uh, black principal of high school. Helen Faison was the first. Mm -hmm. And I was the second, the, the first male. <laughs> It was in the early 80s when the Town and Country magazine named Taylor Alderdice as one of the seven great urban high schools in the country. That was all. I mean, how I felt about that, you know. It's one of the most important assets that we have in, as a community. Uh, without Alderdice, I think, that it, that we wouldn't have anything like the community we have today. What is amazing about Taylor Alderdice today is that the principal, Melissa Fries, who is my son's age, graduated from Alderdice. And she has done a magnificent job of keeping that a top-rated high school in the region and the country. One thing that stayed the same and I always wanted it to be the same was people, you know, and to value the fact that we have a quality staff, um, that we have quality students, and that we value them. Our students, I believe, value the school and want the school to do well. Everyone at Alderdice loves it. I mean, you really form relationships and they facilitate sort of a, an environment that really pushes the love of learning rather than just learning for the test or something like that. And I think that's a, one of the best characteristics of Alderdice that helps people sort of go on in life and be successful in whatever it is that they do. We had incredible people graduate from Alderdice who've gone on to do amazing things. The list is so long of people that are incredibly talented and productive in the community. My great friend Howard Feynman, who has made his mark in politics in Washington, D.C. My great friend Steven Sondheimer, who's one of the infertility experts in the world as a physician. Hillard Lazarus, one of the great lymphoma people in the world. Curtis Martin is a huge name. He was a very famous NFL athlete. Myron Cope, I mean, like, how do we not forget Myron Cope? Um, Bob O'Connor was an Alderdice graduate. Was Khalifa or Mac Miller. I could go on and on and on about people who went to Alderdice with me that became people of national reputation. Every year it feels like there's somebody that's been produced that's gone on to do some really incredible things. That's what I love to see, is how these students are recognized, not just for their academic success, but as being great human beings and really giving back to the community and giving back and forth to their, to their, to their students, to their peers. Do you actually live in Hill? No, much to my distress, distraught. I, but I have a son who lives in Squirrel Hill, so I feel as though I'm a partial citizen. I live in Shady Side, which is the next closest thing. And where do you go in Squirrel Hill? What are some of your favorite shops and places to go in Squirrel Hill? Well, to need I say the Manor, <laughs> everybody's favorite place, and uh, the Murray Hill Cafe, when you can get in. And, I, and the Levin's mattress store. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I'm lucky to have had four children of my own. And I mean, to have my two sons and two daughters and their children, nine grandchildren. And I think Henry and I both have, though we knew very little about how we were when we got married at a very young age, we've been married 68 years. So that tells you something. And somehow we agreed with each other on what should be our approach to living. And our kids, sort of instinctively, I think, picked it up. And I thank Henry Hillman a lot for that because we've never had any arguments about what their responsibilities are to the community. And I feel very proud that if Henry and I disappeared tomorrow, the young people in our family would continue to have the commitment to uh, the community in which they live and where they participate. Mm -hmm.